Hey everybody, Dr. Zuleta here, and I'm here with Dr. Galland, uh, who has an amazing experience, and he can tell us a little bit about his background. Hey, Dr. Galland, thank you for being here, uh, and I would love to hear a little bit about your background. Hey, sure, I've been, um, I mean, I've been practicing medicine for several decades, and I was trained in internal medicine at Bellevue Hospital in New York, and once I had was and I, originally I was teaching and I began to realize that there were real limits to what I was able to teach my students and that there was there was a lot of information about patients that was not incorporated into conventional medical practice you know what they ate what their environments were like what they thought um a lot of their lifestyle factors and so I moved out of academic medicine and I began studying um, everything that I could learn about individuals as it might apply to the, to the practice of medicine, as opposed to studying diseases, because I wanted to understand it from, the, from a different perspective. And that led me down the path that I've stayed with for 40 years. Um, and along the way, I spent a lot of time looking at nutrition and metabolism and their effects and the effects of nutrition on health. Got very interested in omega-3 fats back in the 1970s. Um, magnesium helped to found the American Society of Magnesium Research. Um, and then around sometime in the, around 1990, um, really began to focus on the gut and the gut microbiome. The, the term didn't exist then, but I started looking at the, at the interplay between the different organisms and the GI tract and how that would affect nutrition and how it would affect health. And um, uh, promoted the concept of what's now called leaky gut, not a term that I like, but it has to do with the with the barrier function of the intestinal tract, not just the ability to absorb, but to exclude things that are toxic to the body. And um, along the way, um, attempted to teach what I was learning, applying it to my own patients, but also teaching it to other physicians. Um, part of that effort led to the creation of this field of functional medicine. Um, and um, and then with the onset of the pandemic, I found that I really needed to bring all of the approaches that I developed over decades to try and understand what's happening with COVID-19 and especially this phenomenon of long COVID, which is what I've been focused very heavily on uh, over the past several years. Oh, wonderful! So many questions about each 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 phase. I mean, the magnesium, the the uh, hyperpermeability syndrome, and um, so many things. I, I I can't wait to go into the into the COVID. Um, before we move into the COVID, I'd love to hear your thoughts on maybe what is a big misunderstanding that people have about um, about leaky gut, what they call leaky gut or hyperpermeability syndrome. Um, or a big thing that people don't usually kind of understand about it? Yeah, well, leaky gut is not a single syndrome. It's not a disease. It's not even a condition. It's a physiologic change that occurs um, as a result of many different factors, and it may have many different effects. Um, so... Uh, and in my writing about it, I've always tried to make that point very clear. This is not, oh, I have leaky gut. That's the cause of my problems. Um, leaky gut is one complex set of mechanisms that it becomes an intermediary in creating illness uh, for, of different types. So there are many causes of it, and the causes may be nutritional, 
Um, often they're due to an imbalance in the gut bacteria or the overgrowth of pathogenic organisms, the occurrence um, of a parasite or um, something else that's disrupting the normal ecosystem there. Uh, it can be the result of medication, alcohol, um, certain illnesses will do it. And then there's a vicious cycle that's created because leaky gut is usually associated with inflammation. Now, inflammation itself changes the environment in the gut. Um, and it inflammation causes the release of a substance called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas, and it has both healing and inflammatory and disease-attacking properties. I mean, it's a very... Um, it's like dealing with fireworks you know they can they can be good they can get out of control and but when but like as fireworks leave smoke and they leave debris well nitric oxide uh breaks down into nitrates is converted into nitrates once it's done its function and so when they become active that creates a nit nitrate rich environment and there are certain bacteria that will grow in that environment and others that won't. And so the inflammation itself creates a change because it changes bacterial growth patterns. And I mean, that's one detail, but it, it's, it's important as an example of how this is not just, oh, I have leaky gut. You know, it's a very dynamic, uh, constantly changing situation. And the nitrate issue is something that people are very aware of with groundwater because detergents that are rich in nitrates contaminate groundwater. That changes the growth patterns of bacteria in the water and can lead to overgrowth of harmful organisms and sort of destroy the aquifer. Um, so the same kind of thing can happen in your gut. And there are many stages to trying to restore um, normal barrier function in the gut. So that's um, that probably that's the biggest misconception that I've seen is this notion that leaky gut is like one thing. Yeah, um, it isn't one thing. And, and, and that's generally true in medicine. And, and it, it was the approach that I took to dealing with the issue of long COVID um, because medicine terms to think in terms of diseases and disease categories, like let's name the disease. And if you can name the disease, then here's the treatment for it. Right. And the, uh, so in medical school, we're told, Oh, you treat the patient, not the disease, but doctors are never taught how to do that. They're only taught right. how to identify and treat diseases. Right. And, and that was what, that's really what's missing in medical care is an understanding of how you treat patients as individuals, not as the carriers of specific diseases. So with long COVID, a lot of that energy, I mean, there's been a billion dollars worth of research done into long COVID yeah. and it hasn't really yielded very much. And part of that is because so much of the energy and, and the attention goes into, well, how do we define long COVID? What is it? Um, the approach that I've taken with COVID-19 and long COVID from day one has been, what are the physiologic changes that having this infection creates in your body? And how does understanding those changes impact to every individual patient that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and about two years ago or so, I came up, uh, having reviewed the literature very intensively. I mean, I've spent, since the onset of the pandemic, I've spent about 4,000 hours um, just studying the biology of COVID-19, of the virus SARS-CoV-2, and the impact of it on the body. And then, um, and, and trying to understand that. And so I came up with an, with a graphic about two years ago that I think 
describes a lot of what happens or can happen in the body after COVID-19. I call it the web of long COVID. It's on my website, um, drgallon.com. And there's a, on the landing page, there's an article called long COVID prevention and treatment. Um, it's, I don't know, about 30 or 40 pages long. It, and it has an explanation of this web of long COVID, what the different strands are in the web, how they're connected to one another and what a person can do on their own to try and unravel that web. That's great. I think, um, you know, I remember I can go back to when, when COVID was starting, I was practicing in different hospitals and I just remember the first COVID patient that was really sick and it was just so eye opening. I mean, you know, you look at the lab test, you're watching these things in the news happening. Then you look at the lab test, this COVID-19 is positive. And this patient was, um, you know, it was a guy in his probably 60s, Hispanic American. And um, I mean, he just went into respiratory failure, pulmonary edema, like kind of, you know, very interesting, differently, in a different aggressive way, kidney failure, on dialysis. I mean, and so it was just wow and so that was the first time that i was like wow this is really something else and then the second time that i started thinking wow this is affecting the body in a different way it was we had a patient um this hospital is where uh, another where the patients go after they are in a ventilator for a long time they need a tracheostomy for those of the the, the you know providers listening to these ltac long-term acute care hospitals so that was one of the hospitals that I was practicing at. And this patient had been already on a ventilator for a long time, now with a tracheostomy, but he was still tachycardic. So he was still, you know, now this is four months past his illness and his heart rate was still, you know, 110s, 115s, you know, tachycardic constantly all the time. And so that's when I started noticing, huh, this thing has a longer effect than than most of the other diseases that we know yeah. you know right. um, and 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 there are two um there are actually two explanations for for what you just described i i remember um i i mean in march of 2020 new york became the epicenter and it was really eerie i mean that's where i that's where i and I um, started doing only telemedicine. You know, my office was closed, but I was very busy dealing with patients. The streets were deserted. I mean, it was it was so bizarre being there. And um, I the but I remember just before that, Seattle was the epicenter, and um, and I spoke to a hospitalist in Seattle who's said, this is different. Uh, people are dying of cardiovascular problems. They're not dying of the pneumonia itself. As you just described, this guy went into pulmonary edema. And so one of the characteristics of COVID-19 that is that, it, which is what separates it from the flu and other respiratory infections is it enters the body through the nose. It's a respiratory infection, but it really goes to the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And it is fundamentally a disease of blood vessels. That's one of the things that is so problematic. And the and what you described, this rapid heart rate that this patient had, one of the effects, uh, one of the other effects of COVID-19 is it is through the brain. It it leads to an in excessive stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And that was described, I remember, you know, I remember back in the first year, people were saying, well, we don't quite understand it. I mean, I think there's a good science to explain why it happens. Mm -hmm. But um, stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system leading to rapid heart rate mm -hmm. and um, and then impacting blood flow and and other areas. Um, and, and it happens because certain um, key molecules that regulate the health of blood vessels, the release of sympathetic nervous system discharges from the brain, 
those are damaged by the when the virus enters cells. Um, and that became pretty clear in March of 2020 when the mechanism by which this virus gets into cells was identified. So um, the the approach that I took, uh, this was before long COVID was a concern. This was the acute uh, pandemic, the acuteness of the pandemic. And the standard approach, you know, was, well, um, let's lock everything down until there's a vaccine and then it'll be safe. You know, we're going to flatten the curve. And I realized that was not a great strategy for dealing with this. So I started looking at the physiology of the virus. This is how it gets into cells. This is what it does. And trying to put together, okay, well, what can you do to alter that, to impact it in the acute situation? And if you un and the more you understand about it, the more that you can try to get creative and come up with solutions. And there are a lot of natural solutions. Um, and then once the severity of COVID had begun to diminish because so many people had developed immunity to it between having the, had the disease or having been vaccinated, it's a different, it's a different disease now than it was three years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, then the real concern started to become the long-term effects. And, and they're not only long COVID, which is one concept. In the year after having COVID-19, there's a doubling of the risk of heart attacks and strokes, developing diabetes, developing high blood pressure, having some kind of neurologic or psychiatric disorder. So there are ways in which whether or not you have the so-called long COVID syndrome, which is very real, you are, your susceptibility to other illnesses increases for at least a year, maybe longer. It hasn't been studied that long mm -hmm. after having COVID-19. And some of the studies indicate that that susceptibility does not diminish if with repeated infection. In other words, the, in the VA study, which mostly looked at middle-aged and elderly men, so I can't say it applies to all groups, the more times you had COVID, the greater the risk of having late or long-term complications. Hmm. Um, so it's not as if, oh, yeah, I've had this three times. You know, I'm fine. I mean, each right, time right. the risk of problems, potential problems increases. And I think there are ways to prevent that. I mean, that's been uh, the focus of much of the work I've been doing over the past couple of years has been either treating patients who have been really sick with long COVID. And that's very challenging because many of them have been ill for two or three years. Um, and so they've there's actual damage to organs that occurs. Right. Um, but But also trying to help patients that I'm treating not develop the pathological and physiologic changes that lead to these late complications. And I think that is possible to do, uh, just looking at my own experience with it. Yeah, and you mentioned at the beginning of when we were started talking that a lot of the science, and when you review the literature on long COVID or what, you know, they're trying to figure out a name of how to put a name to it, which, you know, is very understandable to try to develop a language around it. But what they're calling post-acute sequela of COVID-19 or PASCs, or, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're probably familiar with that term. So when you're kind of looking at all of this and all of the literature and, the, and all the different definitions of post-acute sequela of COVID-19 or long COVID, like, you know, if somebody listening to this, what what do you think are the criteria or like the definition that we should be guiding ourselves to say, okay, uh, or the diagnosis is, or the lab work, or what is it that we uh, can use to guide right. ourselves we'll, to say, we'll, okay, right. I have this? Yeah, there, I mean, there are a lot of different um, things. This is a very complex condition, and it's not the same in everybody. 
But the first, the first when someone someone consults me and they say I have long COVID, the first thing that I want to know is what were you like before you got COVID nineteen? And of course, I I mean I do this with virtually every pa- new patient that I see. I want to get their life history. Yeah, you know, like what were you like? What was it, where were you born? What was your health like growing up? Um, what what are the significant events in your life that might have shaped the who you were when you became ill? So I, I really want to know what was happening. And now some of my patients, some of the people were like really healthy. I mean, they had great diets, they exercised regularly, they really, uh, you know, and then COVID just decimated them. But there are a lot of people who had underlying problems um, before they got COVID. Right. And if you can understand those, you really have to go back and incorporate that into understanding what do we, what, what needs to be done for this person. Now, um, so the first definition, the first thing is, how different is this person now than they were before they got COVID? And, and that can be complicated because some people got sick after a vaccine and some people had COVID more than once. But we'll try to get go back to the beginning, pre-pandemic. If I had met you in, you know, January of 2020, how what would I what would I have encountered? How would you have described yourself? What were you like? And um and how is that different now? And um so in looking at the long COVID component specifically i want to know what's different between then and now and there are about 200 different symptoms that have been attributed to long covid but i mean the major ones are fatigue brain fog pain um shortness of breath generalized pain or are three it could be specific headache is one Uh, a lot of um dizziness um and you know, there was a there was a study that got a lot of publicity done at Yale and Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, where they were looking at characteristics of people who had long COVID versus people who had recovered fully. One of the lead authors on that study said they had a really hard time finding a control population because there were a lot of people that signed up and they said, yeah, I'm over COVID. I'll, I'll I'll be in your control group, but when they questioned them more clearly, they weren't the same person they had been before. They weren't going to the gym the way they used to because they would really get tired at the gym now. So they had to eliminate about fifty percent of the allegedly healthy people because they actually weren't functioning as well as they had been prior to COVID nineteen. Um, so it's a really important, so that's an important thing to ask. Um, like how similar are you now to what the way you were before any of this happened? And let's look at the differences and try to figure out what's creating the differences and what may be creating those changes or those differences are direct effects of COVID-19. Um, and I'll get to those in a minute, but also maybe it's, the aggravation of an underlying problem that you had before. It was pretty well controlled, it wasn't really bothering you. But now, you know, like asthma or allergies or but 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 since the pandemic, it's gotten much worse. And um and is that a reflection of your having had COVID? Well, let's look at what COVID can do to your body. And one of the first areas to look at is blood clotting mm-hmm. um, because this is a disease that impacts the lining of blood vessels all over the body. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, there's some inflammation of the blood vessel lining. It's very subtle. That creates a state of increased blood clotting and hypercoagulability of blood. There are tests that can allow us to identify that and there are things that can be done about that that is um but 
from my perspective, it all starts with two things that happen when you get COVID-19. The, the virus enters your cells, most cells, not 100%, but most cells by attaching to a protein on the surface of the cell. This protein is called ACE2. ACE2 is a vitally important enzyme. It, um, uh, it protects the lining of blood vessels, for example. It regulates blood sugar and blood pressure, and it's anti-inflammatory and prevents blood clots. I mean, it does a lot of positive things. In the brain, it regulates the sympathetic nervous system and the outflow of sympathetic activity. So this rapid heart rate that occurred in your patient four months after COVID, it's probably due to damage to ACE2 in the brain. Um, and uh, when they've done studies in animals that, that they've inactivated ACE2 in the brain, they can see this, the rapid heart rate, um, the increase in sympathetic outflow, the fight or flight response. It's an anxiety. uninhibited, uninhibited, sympathetic yes. response. Right. And, yeah, right. and the inflammation part, I mean, I, you know, I, I did some training in England and we always got CRP, C-reactive proteins and erythrocyte sedimentation rates, ESRs on patients. Use like a, pretty much every patient that comes into the door, we get those blood work. So when I came to the U.S., nobody got that blood really? work. Really? Okay. Yeah, most of the times. You know, you got it yeah. maybe in a patient that had polymyositis or, uh, you know, a significant uh, autoimmune disease. But when COVID hit, I was so surprised that now that was a part of the protocol to get ESR sure. and CRP because of the high level of inflammation that is going on throughout the vasculature, like right. you mentioned. Uh, and, so, uh, and so you were saying that uh, uh, ACE2 probably has a lot to do with the uninhibited sympathetic response. Yeah, the, so these patients then have all kinds of symptoms because of that. Damage to ACE2 is one of the central factors in the complications of this infection, both the acute severe complications and the long-term complications. And there are ways to protect it. I mean, these have been studied. I mean, they've been studied in experimental models. It's not as if they're clinical trials, but there are dietary factors, gut-related factors, and specific supplements that enhance ACE2 activity. Uh, there are some drugs that may do it also, but I prefer the supplements because they're safer. And mm -hmm. um, certain antioxidants will do it. Uh, in the brain, there's an antioxidant called alpha-lipoic acid mm -hmm. that in laboratory studies was shown to prevent the toxicity, uh, um, to prevent the, the, some of the negative effects of damaging ACE2 and to reduce the sympathetic outflow. So I remember I had a patient who had a relatively mild case, manageable case of mm -hmm. COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And maybe about a weekend, she said, I'm really beginning to experience a rapid heart rate. And it's just, it's very disturbing to me. I said, what you need is alpha lipoic acid. Within 24 hours, of starting alpha lipoic acid or heart rate calmed down. It was kind of, I, and I think that was proof of this principle that if you can protect ACE2 in the moment when the infection is acute, you can do a lot to prevent the late complications. Um, once there's, once you start getting actual damage, it, it's much harder and it takes longer to begin to reverse this process. Um, one of the best known complications, late complications of COVID-19 is this condition called POTS, P-O-T-S, which stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Mm -hmm. And that is a major player in the fatigue and dizziness and dysfunction that a lot of people experience. There are different types of POTS. Mm -hmm. In most people with COVID-19 have what's called hyperadrenergic POTS. That is, there's an excess activity of the sympathetic nervous system in the brain that is driving this. So 
it's normal when you go from lying to standing that your sympathetic nervous system will kick in. If it didn't, all your blood would pool in your legs and you'd pass out. Mm -hmm. um, so, but with POTS, with the hyperadrenergic POTS, there's an excessive response. Um, so you get too much sympathetic nervous system activity. That's why you get symptomatic. Uh, you know, instead of just the right amount, it's unbridled, unchecked. Mm -hmm. And that's that originates with the loss of ACE2. But by the time someone has actually developed that, merely restoring ACE2 may not be enough. Definitely. And, you know, because there's a snowball effect. People get deconditioned. You can't do anything. You feel so terrible. And so you need to relieve the symptoms. The ultimate treatment is reconditioning, if you can do that. Mm -hmm. But you need to be able to control and relieve the symptoms so the person can get reconditioned. So they're just, the longer this goes on, the more levels of um, physiologic change in the body that occur, and the more complex it is to try and return a person to being normal. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think, you know, one of the things that is under, probably under, you know, under talked about is, you know, when you have somebody in the ICU that is on a ventilator and they're having acute respiratory distress, which most, a lot of the people with COVID had, and like you said, it goes into the vasculature and then it damages the vasculature and then it makes it, it almost punches holes in the vasculature of the lungs, which causes that then that liquid to leak out into the into the into the tissue of the lungs itself, and then causing the 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 swelling of the lungs and and people to have mm -hmm. to not not being able to breathe. But like you said, some people can recover from that, but literally, you know, the damage can be so much that the lungs then are um have damage you know right. and the same with the brain the studies that are showing why people have cognitive decline after being in the icu is because the same thing is happening in the brain that the vasculature then has so much inflammation damages and you're having literally what they can see in microscope is like micro strokes and so when you're mentioning the the alpha i had kind of a couple of questions the first what is the data on the alpha lipoic acid? Did they test like outcomes on that? And how was no, that? I, and then the second is, part. Yeah, go ahead. Go. We can there actually, the there is a study on alpha lipoic acid in long COVID. Um, uh, I think it was combined with coenzyme Q10, both at pretty low doses, um, lower than I would be using ordinarily, which showed beneficial effects. Uh, in terms of energy and recovery. These were people who already had long COVID. Um, they didn't look at mechanisms. They just looked at outcomes. You right. Know, if somebody gets usual treatment or a placebo and someone else gets this, gets alpha lipoic acid and coenzyme Q10. And what happens, um, you know, a after three months or so, the, where I came to the alpha lipoic acid, was from looking at the laboratory research. That is, if you start with the understanding that ACE, the damage to ACE2 is a central event, and the next central event, like around that, is damage to the mitochondria. So how do we repair that? How do we come in early to prevent that from going on to create actual disease? Um, and uh, that's the way that I approached it with with my patients i wasn't going to wait for placebo controlled trials to come out saying oh this is this is the treatment because those could take decades i mean they still haven't come up with those for chronic fatigue syndrome for example or other post-viral syndromes right. um so i just would try to think about it from the perspective of physiology and then what are the changes that are occurring in this person. Uh, so one of the things that I would have people do um, is, and then you can do this at home. You can check your heart rate and if possible, your blood pressure, just lying and standing. 
Uh, and there's a technique for doing this called the NASA lean test. It's a 10 minute test. You check your heart rate and blood pressure lying down. You stand up, you lean against a wall so that your muscles are relaxed, not engaged. And you check your heart rate and blood pressure every minute for the next 10 minutes. And I have a link to how to do that in the article on my website. And I have some information about how you might interpret the results and, and what they might mean and then what you can do about it. Um, two things that, I, that you said that I really wanted to refer to because I think they're very important. One has to do with the lungs. Even mild COVID without obvious pneumonia with normal CAT scans can be associated with shortness of breath. And the mechanism there primarily seems to be damage to the blood vessels in the lungs. It's not the lungs. It's not the pulmonary tissue. It's the capillaries, the tiny blood vessels that actually um, begin to disappear. So you get something called a ventilation perfusion imbalance. Very, very subtle and not so easy to measure. Um, um, and sometimes kind of ignored. I've had patients who had really thorough evaluations at major academic centers. And there were definite, there was a definite ventilation perfusion imbalance or what's called an increase in ventilatory dead space. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, the air goes, but there's no blood to extract the oxygen from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of and ignored, so, but and, and there so are things normal, you can do about that. And so in normal, so in normal, that's kind of interesting. So in normal people with normal CT scans, there was a ventilation perfusion mismatch where even though people could take a deep breath, this breath could not be utilized, what we call dead space. Right, right, right. And there is a, there's a physician um, in Boston um, who's, I think is Harvard affiliated, uh -huh. um, Harold, uh, Dr. Lee, L.I., who has created computer alg algorithms looking at this and it. Uh, it's either Duke University or University of North Carolina. Um, they are doing special uh, xenon lung scans uh -huh. and identifying this. I mean, there are techniques for proving that this is happening. And what and, and what's happening at a molecular level? If you know the if you know like what's happening that is causing a, uh, a uh, ventilation perfusion. Uh, I, I think I think there's actually. There's a, there's a loss of capillaries. And this has been better documented. It's more easily documented in other tissues. There's studies looking at, um, one of the best studies actually used um, microscopy of, of the vessels under the tongue. And, and they used that because they could see it. You know, it was accessible. It was non-invasive. And they what they documented was that people who that with acute COVID-19, there was actually a loss in the density of capillaries under the tongue. And this persisted in people who got who had long COVID. It didn't persist in people who recovered fully. The same thing, something similar has been observed in the retina of the eye. Um, so there is actually a loss of capillaries wow. that occurs. Now, and Dr. Lee's work and with his algorithms, probably points to the same thing happening in the lungs. But I mean, that's not so easy to do. You, you know, you need biopsies and, you know, and, and lung biopsies are not even designed to look at that. That is, right. there's no, there's no pathologic technique that's designed for that. Um, so that's a phenomenon. Now that probably happens in the brain also, and you'd mentioned that. And, and there were two studies early on done in the UK that were, I think, were very important um, and speak to the effects of this on the brain. Um, they don't speak to the mechanism, but uh, the first study was one in which um, a whole bunch of people who had had COVID-19 um, were given some tests of neuropsychological function. Uh, that they did online. I mean, there were thousands and thousands of people in this study. 
Mm-hmm. And when they controlled the groups for their age, their sex, their ethnic background, um, what they found was people who had COVID-19 had specific cognitive deficits as a group, not every individual, but um, determined several months after the infection. There were specific cognitive deficits in that group, and they involved um, certain aspects of um, uh, spatial memory, spatial and visual memory, and um, high-level, um, making high-level cognitive decisions that involve memory. Now, they, at the same time, there was another study done in the UK where they looked at people who had had MRIs of the brain before the pandemic. And they took several hundred of them and repeated those MRIs after they'd had COVID or if they hadn't had COVID. And what they found, and then they tried to match them up for the duration of time between the two MRIs and their age and their sex and and underlying and severity of the COVID and things like that. And what they found was that after COVID-19, there was a change in the MRIs in the brain. It was not found in the people who did not have COVID. And it involved the areas that are that um are responsible for things like visual spatial memory mm-hmm. and higher level um making higher level cognitive decisions it lined up pretty well with the functional deficits that had been seen now further studies looking at the impact of covid on the brain have shown that there's a change in blood flow and a lot of this may not be due to damage to the brain itself. There will be some people in whom there's actual inflammation in the brain, mm-hmm. but but a lot of this had to do with the same phenomenon that's being observed in other parts of the body, loss of blood flow, mm-hmm. loss of, if, if there is, where you can measure it, there's actual loss of capillaries, and so you need to create new capillaries. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of, um, studies that look at what are the markers for how can you tell if someone might have long COVID by looking at a blood test? There are a lot of the changes that happen after COVID-19 are complicated. I mean, you can, it's not as if there's a blood test that you can give somebody and say, oh, this is, this is de- definitively a post-COVID effect. So yeah, you're, so, you're measuring because that's what I was wondering. Like when the um it recovered trial in for, that was published in the JAMA article on on JAMA Journal, you know that even the definition of post acute sequela of COVID or long COVID, they were trying to say that like you either had a positive test or a negative test or symptoms. So I was just like, oh man, this is so confusing. Like, how do right. you how do you right. know? And, right? Right. So how do you right. navigate so one, that. Yeah, it's it, right. So there, what they're trying to do is to is those tests are trying to decide who actually had COVID and who didn't, because there are a lot of people who had COVID and either didn't have symptoms or they had symptoms but they tested negative. So how do you tease apart those groups? But so far, the closest thing to a test that really distinguishes who might have long, who has long COVID and who doesn't, is a test that looks at two markers of um, blood vessel health. And um, they're not, this is not yet commercially available in the US, but something called angiopoietin-1 and uh, P-selectin. And elevated levels of those two were able to distinguish long COVID from recovered COVID with about an accuracy of 96%. You you, you said angiotensin 1? And no, angiopoietin 1. Angiopoietin 1. Right. And P-selectin. And P-selectin. You know, you get to the point, that I think this is fascinating because <clears throat> uh, the pulse test, which is a P-U-L-S-E for mm-hmm. cardiovascular risk yes. prediction, 
you know, it's, it's, it's kind of starting to change the paradigm as to how we look at cardiovascular risk. And I think you just mentioned like such an important thing that we just used to think, oh, if you have an angiogram and, and, and you have a blockage artery, that's when like the crisis is happening. Yeah, yeah, right. But but there is like a multitude of molecular markers that are starting to happen. And so that's so interesting that there is markers that are associated with uh with with uh with post acute right. COVID. The, yeah. Right. So these had what's so here's what's interesting about them. These are both markers of um, what we'll call vascular health. And they actually seem to be markers of the body trying to restore healthy blood vessels. In other words, they're not so much Amazing. The, the damage themselves. This is the body. So, so the, in, the, in the recovery from COVID-19, those people who are struggling to restore vascular health are the ones that seem to be, have the long COVID symptoms. Um, That's but, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it is. But we can, you know, I mean, there are just so many layers to this. You talked about heart attacks, and there was a study just published that found that the virus, pre well, actually, there's several studies that when the virus gets into the lining of blood vessels, the health of the blood vessels matters. Um, and um, because there's been a lot of controversy. Does the SARS-CoV-2 virus get into the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels or don't they? Mm -hmm. And so there was research. I, I don't remember where it was done now, but mm -hmm. it was quite brilliant, actually. Mm -hmm. Most of the animal studies are done with very young mice. You know, I mean, you know, they're like eight to 10 weeks old. Right. And yeah. and most of the studies that are done in test tubes are done with cells that are basically very young. That is, they've their first past cells that just been grown. For sure. Well, human infants don't get very sick with I mean, young children don't get very sick with COVID-19. So th those models are not a good model of mm. COVID-19 in the human population. So this group took um uh, they, they created uh, in tissue culture, uh, they grew the cells from the line blood vessels, um, which are easy to get. I mean, you get them from, mm -hmm. um, from um, uh, you know, the placenta or, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. after birth, you can. So it's an excellent source of those. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they kept growing them. That is, they did several passes. They would grow them until they were fully matured and had covered the, the plate. Um, and then they took those and they grew them again. And as they kept passing the cells through, after about 12 or 15 passes, these cells started to look like the cells of middle-aged and older adults. You know, they were showing signs of senescence and aging. When that happened, the virus could get into the cells easily and stay there. With the very young cells, the virus would get in, was gone in three days. It couldn't survive in these very young cells. Mm -hmm. But in the older cells, it had no difficulty surviving and creating inflammation and damage. And it especially um, gets into atherosclerotic plaque. I mean, the, 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 and it gets in because it gets into the, to the white blood cells, the macrophages, the immune cells in the plaque. It's not just the, mm -hmm the lining cells of the blood vessels, the endothelial cells, you know, the plaque in blood vessels has a lot of immune activation. There's a lot of inflammation there. That's what the pulse test is showing. So it's those, it's those inflammatory cells that become home to the virus. And then the inflammation increases, which probably explains why people get, why the rate of heart attacks doubles in the next year. Yeah, and that's that's very clinically relevant because when you look at the numbers, <clears throat> older individuals that were chronically ill got the worst of it. You oh, know, yeah, low, lower reserve, and so that's interesting that there has been studies that show that the the senate the 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 the, the age of the cells are directly tied. So what you can see in a cell, you can see clinically in the population. You know. Yes. 
Right, right. It's um, yeah. The the translational aspects of this, I think, are really significant, and there are things that can be done about this. Yeah. Um, and there may be some pharmacologic treatments, but there are a lot of nutritional treatments. Mm-hmm. There's basically senescence is about nutrition and lifestyle. I mean, it's not about drugs. You know, con- preventing senescence is really about how you live and how you eat. And yeah, yeah, and 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 in terms of you know, you've focused a lot of your practice being uh, you know helping people that have had these problems. Um, what are some of the supplements that you know science has shown, and then that you've seen in your practice, just clinically, anecdotally, like you know, help your patients along with 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 the symptoms. Well, in the case of long COVID, because uh, um, that question is way too general if we're talking right, about yeah, long COVID, yeah, I yeah, deal yeah, with. yeah, yeah. So there, um, in the case of long COVID and acute COVID, there are some studies indicating things that are definitely helpful. Um, I mentioned alpha lipoic acid. Um, other antioxidants make a difference. Uh, there are a number of herbs and spices, or polyphenols derived from them. Curcumin, very important, and has been shown to decrease the severity of acute COVID-19. Quercetin, a bioflavonoid, also very important. Um, Resveratrol, not received quite as much attention, but that's a polyphenol that's found in red grapes and and a bunch of other, Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of spices and some other fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. And One of the things about curcumin and resveratrol is that they've been shown in laboratory studies to increase the expression of ACE2 in the cell. Interesting. So my approach is uh, involves, let's try to restore ACE2 activity with, um, and, and, and when someone's had COVID, um, someone hasn't had COVID, you can build up ACE2 with exercise and diet people who are recovering from covid you've got to be careful about exercise a lot of them have gi symptoms so they can't do everything you'd want them to do with the diet but you can certainly um use some of these other measures vitamin d very important Mm -hmm. in decreasing the the severity of covid19 it also helps to restore ace2 so vitamin D, um, resveratrol, curcumin, omega-3 fats, mm-hmm. which has been something I've been passionate about for about 40 years. Oh, um, omega-3 supplements have been shown to decrease the severity of acute COVID in people who are hospitalized. Mm-hmm. Um, they have an indirect effect in boosting levels of ACE2 that's been documented in human clinical trials, um, they, what the omega-3s do, or one of the things they do, um, is to stimulate the synthesis of some peptide hormones called apolins, and apolins raise ACE2. Interesting. So, yeah, so, I mean, not too many people know anything about the apolin signaling system, but it has a definite impact um, in COVID-19 um and that has been studied and um studies at the university of south florida Uh, again you know look the what we need is translating a lot of this basic science research into actual clinical trial research that's beginning to happen we're starting to see some studies coming out that show positive effects Definitely. Um, I know that, you know, I definitely want to respect your time. And so I had two questions, like maybe three, and then we can, we can, uh, we'll close. Um, the first one was the CoQ10, uh, is so much, you know, there's so much research on these molecules and in infertility, cardiovascular health. I mean, it's amazing how it's making itself, his way into clinical practice. Uh, infertility doctors, I mean, across the country are, use it uh, in all the major centers. 
um, cardiovascular, you know, th- that. So you mentioned that. So I would be interested to learn about that one. Uh, and then the second piece that I wanted to ask you is um, from a psychological perspective, uh, how have you kind of noticed that your patients um, overcome this traumatic experience of life altering and then the last piece is you know what's what's exciting for you into the future and what are you working on so and i can repeat okay. them if you want i know it's a lot sure, no, I'm, I'm, okay so coq10 is pretty easy it, it it is very important for the function of mitochondria that generate 90 percent of the energy that your body needs and um coq10 within a part of the mitochondrial complex is kind of is like a shuttle back and forth that um and in being shuttled back and forth from one state to another it allows the generation of atp um and it works in conjunction with a form of niacin called na nad or nadh um and very safe um rarely see any side effects with it um doses of anywhere from 100 to 600 milligrams or 800 milligrams a day. Typically 200 to 300 milligrams will work. Um, and especially important for energy. That is, if somebody has just had COVID and their energy is not coming back, there, there's CoQ10 is the thing that is most likely to help them recover, sometimes with niacin or one of the der- derivatives of niacin. Um, as far as the psychological trauma, um, there, the, what people need when they have a serious illness is an explanation, like what's happening? What can I do? And mm. I would say that the way the mm. COVID and long COVID were presented publicly to the population was very damaging psychologically, especially long COVID. And I tried to address this a couple of years ago in a video that I created um, to, to explain it. What was the way long COVID was presented to the public is there's this mysterious disease. We don't know anything about it. We don't know what causes it. We don't know what to do about it. It can totally debilitate you and there are no answers. And so there's a billion dollars of research being done. I mean, that is very frightening. In yeah. fact, we know a lot about long COVID. And disempowering. Yeah, it's very disempowering. Yeah. Um, so the first thing, and 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 I have had so many people who just contacted my office and said, or or wrote in or something, who said, Thank you for putting this meta this information out there. I mean, this is the first bit of hopeful news, you know, that I've gotten. You know, here's an explanation. Okay, great. You know, if we understand what's going on, and we do on a lot of levels, then we can, you know, then we can move from that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and that that's something that I've just observed over and over again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, one of the big problems with doctors, and, and, and this is not just conventional practitioners, this includes a lot of alternative practitioners, is disempowering patients. Worst thing that you can do for someone. Yeah, there are some people that need you to come in and say, this is what you've got to do. You know, I'm in charge here. Yeah, sometimes there are situations like that, certainly in critical care situations. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the, the patient just wants to be, you just want to hand it over to yeah, an expert. For but, sure. And, and you've seen that, obviously. Mm-hmm. But but um, with most of these long-term chronic issues, empowerment of the patient is critical Mm -hmm. and support from family and friends. And sometimes that means that the the support environment has to be nourished and they have to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, the tendency to dismiss this. I've had so many people who contacted me and said, oh yeah, I went to my primary doctor and he said, oh, you need to see a psychiatrist. It's all anxiety, it's all in your head. Mm. Uh, I mean, that is so that that is so damaging mm. and, and it really interferes with the ability of people to get better. Um, mm. And what was the third question? And the third question is, um, 
what is exciting for you and you're right it's all in your head but it's in a different way that you think <laughs> yes you know right it's because there is damage that has been done that we can work on it and improve uh towards like oh yeah the right mentioned this, yeah yeah the split between mind and body is absurd in medicine right. yeah and, and but but the fear the fear that you get yeah yeah that'll amplify things and, yeah and in fact just one example of that and then I'll move on to the third question. I mean, yeah. this is what excites me. It's trying to figure out what, what has always excited me and continues to is finding ways to solve problems that um, are not being dealt with properly. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I can do that best on an, on an individual basis, like working with a person. How does, how to help this person solve these problems that they're not getting answers to mm. uh, that is really what's exciting and and um and I, I i happen to love working with people who want to take responsibility they want to be actively involved because then we're we're partners mm. okay they're um and uh, i mean that that is what is really satisfying mm. most satisfying um so yeah, that, I hope that, I've yeah that's great and that was my last question that like you know what's exciting and what are you looking forward to uh and uh and and what are you working on you know moving on to the future uh well well what I am working on kind of intellectually right now is the web of long COVID and I've been looking there are like 10 strands in this web that are all connected mm -hmm. to one another and uh, and they cross each other at what we'll call nodes. So over the past couple of years, I've been intensively studying each of the strands mm -hmm. and the nodes mm -hmm. and kind of digging down. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what's been amazing, and this has been an amazing experience, I'm, and, and it, it seems to never end. At least my wife says this never ends. But... Mm -hmm. um, but I am getting close to a con to some areas of conclusion with it. I've made yeah. my way through most of it. When you dig down, what you realize is it's as if there's a whole under all of these things are connected at a very deep level. It's as if you start digging here to get some information and you discover a whole underground cave system in which all those points on the surface are not only then there's not only a map on the surface, they're all connected at a very deep level. Mm -hmm. And um, and being able to understand those connections may allow me to come up with solutions um to problems that that are that are, you know, you, you kind of get stymied by. You work with somebody, some people really get better. They I'm um, mm -hmm. there's a young woman who came to see me first, um, I don't know, maybe almost two years ago. At the time she had just gotten married, she couldn't get through an airport without a wheelchair. I and mean, that's how sick she was. Um, roughly 10 months ago, she ran a 5K. Um, she's training for another one. She's trying to get pregnant. So you see responses like that, and that that's great. I mean, that's what you want. But there are other people who really... Uh, you know, we're just really stuck. And so I hope to be able to use this understanding of the underground network of mm -hmm. relationships to figure out, okay, what do we do with the people? What, what can, what can we do to help the people who have not gotten helped, mm -hmm. who, who have not recovered? You know, what, what things, what tools do we need? What are we missing? I mean, that kind of challenge that, that's what has um, fueled me, from, mm -hmm. you know, my whole career. Mm -hmm. um, and it continues to. Mm -hmm. I'm 80 years old. I have no plan on slowing down. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And like you said, some people need understanding and looking at all of these, um, you know, implications that you're looking at to help people understand their different presentations. It can be very healing for them and empowering. So, um, so if people want to look more into this, they go to drgallon.com. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. there's this, there, there's this, um, document there. 
that um, uh, was put up at the beginning of the year, uh, probably add something to it uh, sometime yeah. when I can find time to do that. Um, yeah. But it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive review of what we know. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much because we need this so refreshing. Um, somebody that can look at this from a perspective of being helpful and, and, and really helping people understand what they're going through. So uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Gallen. It's been hey, a real pleasure right. talking good to talking, you. Good talking to you today. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you for allowing me to share this information. Oh, no, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs>